Um, so it's great to be here. Um, thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Jeff. Um, thank you, George. And um, I especially want to thank um, Sarah Richardson, Giovanni Straquadano, and Kun Yang, um, who uh, I won't, you know, who uh, who I who I worked with on uh, this project. So the title is "Mistakes Were Made," and um, what I want to talk about is that the mistakes the mistakes we made in the design of the SC 2.0 genome. So I know that the session is focusing on design software, um, but I really love writing software. Um, I find it much less exciting to talk about, I have to say. But instead, what I really want to focus on is if we knew now what we knew when we started the project, what would we have done differently in the design on the computational side, um, also on the higher order side. Um, so uh, scientific partners uh, in this room, Jeff Buka and Leslie Mitchell, um, who really spent a lot of time sitting next to um, scientists from my lab, um, funding partners, NSF, DOE, Autodesk, Microsoft. Um, also, I, we have to thank uh, DARPA, who we worked with on, uh, on different aspects, more de novo design as opposed to rewriting a genome, and then our international partners. Um, it was fantastic to work with. I can't say enough great about them. All right. So when I started this project with Jeff in 2000s, well, when I joined the project with Jeff in 2007, which, with Jeff and Chandra, you know, we thought about three main, three main problems. Models, so how do we map from genome sequence to fitness if we want to design a yeast cell that's highly fit? Algorithms, so we have a sequence we want to make. There are constraints. Um, how do we design algorithms that do things efficiently? And then finally, execution, which is essential for a reduction project, actually, um, designing it all, making it all, ordering it all, putting it all together, tracking where everything is. So currently, 11.3 um, megabases designed, uh, chromosomes 1 to 16, plus the bonus tRNA neochromosome that um, Patrick talked about. And what I will focus on is results with the 3.5 megabases that are done, chromosomes 2, 3, 5, 6, 10, and 12, um, what mistakes were made in design and execution, and what will we do differently. So um, there's some known design flaws, maybe features that are really not design mistakes. So um, one example, if you read the, the, the papers that came out, is that um, there are some issues with changes in ribosome levels. That is really all due to the strategy of taking the tRNAs um, off of their home locations and putting them on the separate neochromosome that's added back later. So during the process, there's a transient where the copy number of a tRNA is different. And so if it's too low, uh, more ribosomes, so we see that in the strains without the neochromosome. If there are too many tRNAs, that also causes a compensation. That should all get corrected. So that's not really a design flaw. Um, actually, so here is actually a flaw. Um, I think we should recall this part. Um, it's functional, but it has some issues. The universal telomere cap, that if you read the papers, it says systematically for a couple chromosomes, it's not, um, it's not insulating the silencing. The silencing extends a little bit too far into the subtelomere. Um, so that has been corrected in some ways. It's exacerbated a little bit because we cleaned out a lot of junk from the subtelomere. It's an area with a lot of pseudogenes. Um, so that, you know, I would say that's a small, a small thing, easy to fix. Um, inherent risk, LOXP sim sites. So, so far in the chromosomes that have been made, about 1,000 LOXP sim sites. Um, they've caused some problems in chromosome assembly. They seem to seed off-target homologous recombinations, occasionally tandem duplications, trivial to catch, reasonably easy to fix, although maybe some of the labs in China would debate that. But here I think this is inherent risk. It's, you know, I'm not sure that there's a better strategy to get these sites in there. So I, you know, there might be, causes some trouble in assembly. Um, we knew it'd be a problem. Actually, I think we're a little surprised that it's not more of a problem. A real bug with the LOXP sim sites. Um, out of the thousand, two of them affect um, the promoter of a neighboring gene. Um, one, it changes the transcription start. Uh, the other actually affects the expression level. Unclear how to predict them. These are two real bugs out of the thousand. Um, I don't think there are more because there is very, very thorough exploration of RNA seq data without really any other genome wide evidence. Um, another real bug synonymous recoding. Um, primarily, this was for PCR tags, for watermarks, about 60 KB of bases affected. Um, 
Also, there's some recoding for restriction enzyme sites, about 5,000 um, bases, so a far smaller fraction. So out of these 60,000 bases, three bugs, a bug rate of five times 10 to the minus fifth, um, much better than my bug rate when I'm programming. Um, so one of these, unclear why, um, one of them possibly a stem loop, possibly could have been avoided, um, and the other introduces a RAP1P binding site. Um, RAP1P then um, down, down regulates transcription. Um, going forward, we could have um, incorporated these, these constraints, but we probably would have had false positives. It's a trade-off between experimental and computational effort. So um, in this whole project, um, five bugs. Um, no bugs with the stop code on swaps, um, tRNA deletions, repeat deletions. Uh, so I think actually maybe the biggest design flaw was the lost opportunities and being a little more aggressive in the design. So for example, there are several codons with a codon frequency less than 10% um, relative usage, 30 to 70,000 occurrences. Uh, applying the five times 10 to the minus fifth bug rate for this sort of bug, you know, maybe we would have had three to five more fitness defects. I think actually a little bit more because these are more in the five prime region where there's evidence that there's some effect on transcription, but still, I think we could have been more aggressive. This is something that Jeff and I talked about, and we decided that, you know, we wanted to value fitness. Um, execution errors, like really mostly these emails that come from someone, um, we have to order bag oligos now. Um, but, you know, really amazing to me how few errors things like that cost. Um, annotation errors, so here's something else that, that we learned, that um, GenBank changed their validation script for the yeast genome sequence, and um, there, are, there, there are things in the reference sequence annotation that GenBank no longer accepts that we had to go back and fix. Um, so I think that, so the challenges, so what do I think the challenges actually are for, say, a human project? You know, we always think of the human genome as different. And during the human genome sequencing project, we thought it was so much more complex, definitely has more repeats. But in the end, we were very surprised, I think, as a community, how similar it was to what we think of as simpler organisms and uh, how far fewer genes we th it had than a lot of early estimates. So I suspect that, you know, with mammalian, the cost of debugging seems to be a lot lower um, than what we thought it was. Um, in cost-benefit analysis, I think the benefit of a more aggressive design, primarily in the pilot phase, I think, with design ideas tested, pro outweighs the cost of fixing errors. You know, the, the debugging strategies, um, they work pretty well. They don't take my time, they take experimentalist time, so it gives me more time to think. Um, but, you know, I think this is, I think this, uh, this is, this is the main message for me, that if anything, our biggest design flaw was not being more aggressive in, in what we wanted to do. So maybe SC3.0. So sorry to be such a conservative guy. Uh, in some but, ways. But uh, one thing I'd li like you to comment on, too, and we talked a little bit about this yesterday, is uh, we heard from Jacob Beal about um, the opportunity to introduce an SBOL standard. And obviously, anytime you add, you know, t things to your to-do list, uh, it it's more work. So. Could you talk a little bit about the cost-benefit analysis? So I think there is, so the great benefit I see there is having a system with tools that you can immediately plug into. So with what we are doing, we did that with the GFF standard. So it's a different type of standard. But really, if you have something in a format like that that complies to a standard, that means that, say, somebody's developing a fancy, fantastic editing tool. If it is compliant with SBAL, then anything you make, you should be able to use a tool like that for editing, for visualization, for ordering. Um, the main, so the main thing I see with ontologies is, is just making it clear to somebody how they can add to it, keeping their namespace distinct, so that you know, when we were putting in PCR tags, we wanted a way to, ha like to see where it fits in to existing ontologies, but in a way that if someone else defines something similar to it, that all of a sudden we don't have conflicts. So I think 
I think it's great. I think it would be great to have tools like that, and then we could focus on thinking about the design as opposed to you know lots of groups all spawning their own efforts. So it's a big reason why the GMOD generic model organism database worked so well, and I think for now for genome writing it would also there also be a big benefit. Uh, Joe, over here. Um, so s some things are only bugs um, when uh, they're executed under certain conditions or certain orders of operations. That certainly is the case in software. And um, I was wondering if you could comment on kind of the original conception of what you thought of uh, would be a bug. And you know, did you, you know, say that? Oh, let's say, you know so everything that's compromising growth rate by more than ten percent is considered a bug. Um, and how do you quantify some of those things given that the space of viability is, you know, not well defined in, in the space? So I think we are, so here I would say a bug is any measurable difference in growth rate. Um, there are some small decreases, but if we have too many of them, they accumulate. And uh, also for, for bug, I think it's fit growth rate under many different conditions. I am not sure I have to say exactly how many conditions the cells are probed under, but um, I, like, I, I, different media, different temperatures, I don't know, maybe one of the experimentalists could comment on that quickly, how many growth rates, how many different environments, conditions, hundreds, thousands, 10 to 30. Yeah. So, but then, you know, if, if someone is doing experiment in a different condition um, and finds a defect, I think this is you know, sort of the, the system where it's actually much easier to debug than we thought it would be. I think that was sort of why we were a little less aggressive, is we thought if there is a growth defect, it'll be a lot of work to map it and fix it. And I think in the end, there are far fewer defects than maybe we had expected. And also, um, fixing them has really been feasible. Although, a lot of work. And thank you for everybody who fixed our mistakes. <laughs>